So hi, welcome everybody to the second Sunday Poetry Series. I'm the series coordinator and curator, Sean Killingsworth. It's wonderful to see so many people here this afternoon and I'm really thrilled to be able to showcase three incredible poets. Today we have Barbara Berman, Claire Blotter, and Linda Michelle Cassidy. Before we get started, I wanna do a little bit of housekeeping. I am recording this reading and we'll post the video on um, the SSPS YouTube channel in the coming days. So you can find it in the chat. I've put links up. You can also go to the website and follow us on Twitter. So um, it should all be there for everybody. Yeah, it's in there. So as usual, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the Marin Poetry Center for letting us use their Zoom room, which is why you'll see the MPC logo when you log in. But uh, you know, the second Sunday Poetry Series has a budget of approximately $0. So I'm very grateful for their help. So Barbara, Claire, and Linda, I am so grateful for you to have, to have agreed to join us today, and I'm very excited to hear your poems. So without further ado, let's begin. First up to the mic is Barbara Berman. So Barbara, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. So take Great. it away, Barbara. All righty. Thank you, Sean. I know that it really does take a village to organize a reading. So I want to thank everybody who's helped. And I also want to thank Amanda Moore, who opened this door for me today. I wish I could look up and see all of you and your faces as you are zooming in here. I'm glad you're here. I really am glad that, that you're all out here. I want to just open my arms and go like that to you. Some of these poems sound like slightly softened prose, but all of them are a work in progress that's called Going Local. The first piece I'm going to read is called Picasso as Editor, Wernicke. And keep in mind, as I read this very short poem, that we're talking about a really large painting that's beautifully displayed and that no reproduction can do it justice. Picasso as Editor, Wernicke. Enclosed gray spaces without lines permit embrace of shapes of explosive, immense disgrace. The next poem I'm going to read is called Some Grief. It was inspired by comments by Connie Post, who's an East Bay Poet Laureate, and so I dedicate it to her. Some Grief for Connie Post. Some grief is tied to unresolved sorrows you said you'd heard when we spoke of your dog's death, which reminded me that I cried with shuddering, overwhelming sorrow in front of Ghiberti's baptistry doors in Florence, soon after a beloved cat died. And I knew some of what was going on was the reminder that my father hit his children for the crime of crying wept in public once when his mother died and said Florence was so beautiful, it made him cry. The next poem I'm going to read is called Plout Here, he'd say. And it's a memory of Herbert Weinberg, who is the rabbi in the poem. He was a chicken farmer and depending on differing recollections, he and his wife were refined or not. But it is fact that they left Germany in the 1930s with their son who became a professor of zoology at a major university. And in the memories of too few are farmer Plout's gentle, not always necessary reminders to a young Harvard educated rabbi who frequently enjoyed a thimble full of schnapps in the sparsely furnished farmhouse, that other families were in need. And Plout proudly paid his synagogue dues on time, his accent mocked by a boy I knew. And Professor Plout died before I could find more proof of what many missed, confined by convictions of superiority. Found poem, Prague. It is astonishing to see in copies made in Prague of the Hebrew Bible 
and Jacob Ben Asher's The Row, the same styles that appear in Christian Bibles in Latin and the vernacular. Jews and Christians coexisted with difficulty on the Prague streets, yet in their libraries, they inhabited provinces of the same aesthetic country. The Annals of Innisfallen. Cold, clean penance on an island monastery in County Kerry. Wild fern and grain. Body of Christ, brothers. Blackberries pressed for wine and ink for texts. The record under glass in Oxford was stolen by Cromwell's men before they stormed the small gray castle on the south shore. My guide who looked like Carrie Elways in his youth said this with anger so fresh and fierce, I almost wept for the possibility of any peace anywhere. Saved by a Dallas cowboy. At customs in Dallas in 1995, my husband looked so foreign to a young crew cut official in blue uniform, whose grammar was not as good as that of Cliff, who was born in Stockton, California to Chinese American citizens, that the crew cut official in blue kept telling Cliff he had filled out the wrong customs form, that he needed the form for immigrants. Cliff repeated in low, steady tones, bracketed by unreturned sirs, that he, Clifford Lee, was a citizen of the United States, as his passport made clear. And this went on for what seemed like half an hour, but was probably three minutes, as I stifled the urge to blurt something inappropriate about Cliff being technically a representative of California law until a white man behind us wearing a huge brown Stetson looked over and down at Cliff's passport and barely glancing at the crew cut official said, he's good. So our passports were stamped as we said thank you to the Stetson hatted man whose passport was quickly stamped before he loped off into the arms of a tall white haired woman wearing weathered denim and gorgeous boots probably hand-tooled in black with turquoise poppies. There's a fun, um, for poetry geeks, a fun mistype in uh, the first few drafts of this poem I'm gonna read. It's called The Glock I Left Behind, except that I typed it Gluck a couple of times. In Mount Sterling, Kentucky, a gateway to Daniel Boone National Forest, I met a young gun merchant who does not think silencers should be regulated and he will customize your Kalashnikov. Our conversation was cordial but chilling. And before I left his shop, he gave me a keychain with a black plastic block. And I said, thank you and decided to give it to a friend who makes collages, but it felt too toxic. So I left it in the bedside table of a drawer in my hotel room next to a Gideon Bible. When you read a biography, you're always gonna come away with questions. It's, it's just, it's the nature of the thing. This next poem is called Nika Rothschild, Baroness, after a biography by Hannah Rothschild. The unexplained part is road tripping in a Rolls Royce or a Bentley and not a generic American car. I can understand taking a drug rap for a black man in 1958, but not the Bentley he disembarked from to take a pee at a Mississippi crossroad. I wonder if she met her contemporary, Dorothy Day, who with equally large but very different hungers was also fiercely committed to strays. I'm going to read two more poems the next piece is really a shout out to the Biden-Harris inaugural planners. I thought they were just absolutely brilliant in terms of everything that they planned, um, including this next poem, which is called The Reflecting Pool. 
and I uh, wrote it about six or seven months ago and recently tweaked it. I tweaked the very end to steal from President Biden's most recent speech that he delivered on Thursday. This is called The Reflecting Pool, January 19, 2020. For Lori Marie Key and Yolanda Adams, each lamp lit for suffering. And as Lincoln's immense white marble face abides above, we're permanently adhered to reflection at a space designed by a son of Illinois and to recalling two dark-skinned women who sang to their patients and sang here, helping us reflect more deeply the loss of more than 400,000 lives near where slaves were traded and a dagger struck democracy. The last poem I'm going to read is called The Hummingbird. Hummingbirds see more red than humans. And when I see one with wings working as they do, so fast I can't name all its colors. It is blading a small agapanthus I see as pale lavender. And I imagine it sees a meaty crimson as it dives deeper into the flower. And it's fine that I can't go there because watching it dine gives me respite. And that's what I'd tell it if I could speak its language, see what it sees. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much for your beautiful poems. I appreciate it. I'm so glad you could join us. And I'm realizing um, I forgot to read your bio. Uh, we had a couple of technical difficulties in the beginning, and so I got a little flustered. So. If nobody minds, I'm going to read Barbara's bio now so you all know more about her and can appreciate her even more. Um, so Barbara Berman, in 1979 in Washington, D.C., Barbara organized one of the first independent press festivals in the country. Her poetry and prose have appeared in The Village Voice, The Washington Post, Gargoyle, Lilith, Narrative Northeast, and many other publications is the author of a poetry chapbook, The Generosity of Stars from Finishing Line Press and Currents, a full-length collection of poetry from Three Mile Harbor Press. She's lived in San Francisco for 34 years with her husband, Clifford Lee, an environmental lawyer. Her books can be purchased at small press distribution. For signed copies, you can contact Lee directly at her email, which I'm actually going to put into the chat right now, which is a little easier. All right. So thanks again, Barbara. Um, let's see. Next up, we have Claire Blotter. Claire writes and performs poetry with movement and body percussion. She represented San Francisco in National Poetry Slams in Boston and Chicago. Her poetry has appeared in Rattle, Spillway, The Plant Human Quarterly, California Fire and Water, A Climate Crisis Anthology, uh, among other journals and anthologies, as well as in three chat books. Uh, Claire was a finalist for the Fisher Prize and judged the 2019 competition. She has taught writing at SF State University, John F. Kennedy University, Dominican College, and College of Marin. She teaches poetry writing to some very lucky children, uh, in my opinion, and teens through the California Poets in the Schools and Poetry Out Loud programs. So Claire, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself and um, can you hear me? I can hear you, wonderful. Great. Great, thank you so much. She's muted again. Claire, you're muted, hang on one second. Claire, you're muted. My computer has been jumping around on me, so let me try that again. I wanted to thank Sean, Marin Poetry Center, and uh, everyone uh, from, who made this poetry space on Zoom available and for everyone who made space to come today. Um, though I consider myself a performance poet, I have been writing in the last year and a half in short phrases with pauses and periods. 
um, which forces the reader to look ahead in the text and backwards in the text, much as we're doing in the pandemic, thinking about what's just happened and um, where we find ourselves in relation to an uncertain future. So I wanted to start by reading this poem that it came out this month in Spillway and it's called Wavering. Maybe I could do that. Maybe I could join a choir, quietly at first, lip syncing, then loudly to be heard, off key, where my mother couldn't sing, nor swim, really. Well, swim maybe, but with huge clumping kicks and hands cupped rigid as paddle boards, slapping water, splashing everywhere. We tried not to laugh as she struggled to buoy her large body forward, to learn, mouth pursed in a grimace without a shred of pleasure. Yet I do swim now, sing somewhat, unsure in larger lakes without a good teacher, falling to gravity as in second grade, relay racing at a swim party, running along the shallow bottom, thinking I would surely remember once in the deep end to swim, but going under like a rock because I wouldn't admit I couldn't. Later, winning the party prize, tiny Japanese doll in red kimono with bound feet, the father dove in, saved me. And then we did find a pool to practice. So each child learned, singing in the car, at church, drying dishes, each one splitting water, kicking hard. So I wanted to uh, screen share this poem so you can see how many stops and starts are in it. Can you make me co-host, um, Sean? I can't make you co-host, but I think there should be an option below to enable you to screen share. Let's see. Uh, it doesn't let me unless you make me a co-host. Ah, gotcha. It says host disabled. I know this because I'm teaching on Zoom in the elementary and high schools. Okie dokie. So you'll have to give it back to me, okay? I will, but can, can I give it back to you at the at the end? You bet. Okay. I'm trying to, okay, here we go. Here we go, here we go. Can people see that? Is it there? Yeah, it's coming in. I'm, always, Thank you. I'm never sure if it's really there. So this is called Sting. The wasps find a hole inside, a cubicle, a gathering, through wood, to house, buzz on the inside of glass, pain, strive to return out, trapped, dazzled by light, inescapable, impenetrable solidity, window prison, where I try rescuing each tormented body, pushing thorax into plastic container, ripping delicate wings as they rev up against me, struggling, smashed, irreparable, as the hive listens from afar, stores memory to later sting, the soft Achilles between my sock and pant leg, and later, through thick cotton shirt, then my waving hand, by fountain, out of nowhere, remembering, leaving pinpricks, swelling, red patches, spreading, burning deep and deeper, each day, again and again. I 
practice. So I'm going to stop the share and then I'm going to come back and screen share one more. That was a, uh, a wasp nest outside our house during the pandemic. This next poem is called Legacy. My room of anger wasn't meant to shut down the whole house, only stimulate to action. But how do you stop it turning to resentment? The kind my mother carried like a hard lump inside. Giving it up didn't seem an option, though she certainly prayed for that. I'm sure I watched her bent over St. Teresa's church, wooden pews, well before mass for extra time with God at home, on her knees, before bed, for rosaries and novenas. She led for her five children, for special intentions. We weren't told, though I could imagine the difficulty of dissolving pain that solid. That finally she died, I think of it, but passed it on to me, the legacy, tremendous energy of refusing to forgive, lacking the capacity to truly let go of pushing against her which spread to my sister against the whole family. Though I refrain now from falling to my knees, instead sit upright, meditate, breathe, slowly write poetry. To understand the ancestors passing down such strong resistance to opening the delicate bud held so tightly, so long, with petals only dropping one by one, when a sudden shard of lightning, perhaps beauty or unconditional love shoots through me, seemingly by accident, from some unprotected angle, and I am blasted to tears by a random hand, of redemption falling like flames on my crown of thorns, burning, lifting it completely, momentarily away. And um, I'm doing all these kind of uh, dark angel uh, poems of mine. So, uh, but I did put this out in my writing group and they said they also were suspicious sometimes. This poem is called Suspicion. My thin plastic visa vanishes into thin air. I trace the route between Whole Foods and my car five times. Meticulously search floors of the whole Whole Foods store till finally I grill the flippin' checker who made me keep repeating my words muffled under my mask, thinking she must have stolen my card, faking now to get back at me. Are you sure, I insist, for the third time, searching her eyes resentfully till I give up canceling the card. Relieved to find no one has charged hundreds of dollars at Nordstrom's. Yet yesterday, after six months, the car washer who vacuumed my car left the car, tipped up on the back seat floor, somewhat visible for me to find. Not even he took advantage, exonerating himself, the checker, and Whole Foods as guilt boomeranged back, stories of evil taking root in my mind of all those out to get me. And I want to do two more poems. 
Um, one uh, that I wrote recently, remembering when I was 10 years old, uh, watching my sister who was uh, 10 years younger than I am, having a bath, a baby bath, and seeing how lovingly my mother gave her that bath. This is called baptism for MP. Mother in clean blue house dress, gathers fluffy towels, cotton balls, ivory soap, pours warm water, carefully submerges pink baby into a tub where she squirms, then relaxes, recognizing sensation, so like embryonic fluid where she floated days ago. Mother pushes back baby's thick, dark hair, wet now, sticking to her cheeks as she wiggles, turns in tepid liquid, strong, steady hands, slowly drops drip, drip into tub, soapy water, enveloping her, washing away milk, crumbs, traces of the new world. At last, she is lifted carefully in a trickling waterfall, placed like a bundle of jewels inside soft, dry towel spread over bed, wrapped into a tiny sandwich bun, into folds of pliable white bread. A hood in one corner snugly fitting her small head as mother scoops her lovingly in one giant hug. Mother and child, newly born. Tiniest bud reemerging into blankets of air. Small pilgrim, holy monk, offered on life's tabernacle, harbinger of all she will become. Pulled from earth's body, in lingering dampness, newly transplanted, seedling already blooming in her mother's arms. And I went muted, huh? Okay, here we go. Screen share. Um, okay, this is a little story for this poem real quick. This is, um, I had a friend named Becca Ray who passed uh, a couple years ago and she would uh, go to Oakland and she would go to all the bakeries and um, pick up the leftover bread and bring it to centers for poor people. And one of the places she would go would be every uh, November or early December, she'd go to the kiwi orchards in the area. And there are places you can pick the lumpy kiwis that are not round and oval and beautiful enough to, sh to sell in stores. And she would get truckload of these kiwis. And then she would make Christmas baskets with chocolates and kiwis and nuts. And so this is a poem to lighten us up in this challenging time. And it's called, let's do something fun that doesn't hurt anyone. And I just wanted to show you this to show you another form because I feel like form is so important. And especially now when we need new ideas and they often come in, come in new forms. Let's write a letter under or up stream, perhaps stairs, right through splashing water wheels. Let's dive beneath sarcasm, peel back its slimy, skin to that soft kiwi within, sweet, green, delicious, never deleterious to health, but highly beneficial, both on trees and those fallen, strangely odd, deformed fruit that Becky picked by herself, gathered in oversized plastic bags, piled into her truck, and later carefully placed into Christmas bags with chocolate, hard candy, and nuts her friends, gifts for us. Let's not go up to the moon so much anymore or contemplate Mars. What and why have we got to prove and prove and prove and keep looking up when we can find such imperfect abundance here underfoot, fallen on the ground.
I will come off of screen share. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Claire. That was beautiful. Um, I'm going to ask you to make me the host again, if you can. And uh, that was lovely. Thank you so much. So our next poet is Linda Michelle Cassidy. Um, her writing appears or is forthcoming in Rowell, Painted Ride, No Tokens, Catapult, The Tahoma Review, The Rumpus, and elsewhere. She has been, uh, is a senior reviews editor at Tupelo Quarterly board member at Marin Poetry Center, and has been a contributing editor at Entropy. Michelle Cassidy holds an MFA from the Bennington Writing Seminars and another in Visual Arts from California College of the Arts. She's working on two poetry chapbooks and a poetry image installation to be shown at the Army Corps of Engineers Bay Model. She lives on a houseboat in Sausalito, and I am going to share her website with you guys. That's in the chat now, and um, you should be able to click on that later after the reading and find out more about Linda. Um, let's see, Claire, it's, I'm still not the host. Um, You're not the host? You still are. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know how to make you the host now. So in the in the list of participants in the side, there will be a little button next to Yes, okay. More. Okay, so more. Uh, okay, it's not there. Where are you in this list? I'm um, second Sunday poetry series. So it's under the letter S. Is it toward the end? These are usually alphabetical, although not always. Yeah, it's not alphabetical. And I don't, oh, here it is. Okay. Um, got it. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so without any further ado, Linda, um, if you can unmute yourself, I would love for you to start reading your poems to everyone. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you, Sean, so much for inviting me. And oh my God, I am so happy. I have a friend from elementary school, friends from different grad schools, college roommate, residency roommate, um, wild and crazy trip to Ireland roommate. Um, my husband's in exile in another room, so we don't get feedback. I'm sure I forgot. Oh, and writing group friends. So I... Um, I'm sure you're already sated, but here comes some more. And I'll, most of these you don't need to know anything about, but there's a few where you do. And when that happens, I will tell you. Let me just start my clock because I don't want to talk too much. Okay, first up, let me get this on my screen. Nope, I'm sorry. Okay, first up, buoyant. The Great Salt Lake was not as beautiful as I expected. The drive through the desert, the white edged saline crust, the scrubby inway speckled with wildlife warnings. I had to know about the floating, what my body would do, how like outer space it could feel, whether I'd believe I had the water all to myself. I'd been to a sensory deprivation tank once on a whim. I never stopped being aware of the edges, my toes and fingertips brushing the walls, the piped in new age music I hadn't picked. I'd wanted to hear my own blood flowing, to feel solitary and inside out. In it, I'd felt more physical than usual. Here is a body, you own this mess. Yes, it has gravity and mass, but you can never truly know how it works. Inside, maybe some cells are up to no good, plotting their next cruel alliance. I was sent for a CAT scan so the doctors could be sure they were knifing the right thing. They offered me Valium, saying it holds off panic attacks, but I wanted to feel all of it. How to describe the pleasures of stillness and gravity yet somehow floating while nestled in that tube 
with thoughts of my insides, rattling and clicking, flowing and stretching. The hum, the darkness, the muffled voices, and me, the science experiment, only wanting to be left alone. In Iceland, there were floating parties. Fljotja, said the sign at the pool, with foam bonnets and knee pads, somehow enough to keep us aloft. All of these pale bodies safely adrift and gorgeous in the midnight sun. Gentle background in a language I cannot speak. All those swallowed follow syllab final syllables, lulling. My presence accepted, but not noticed. Crazed with wakefulness, I'd swim my daily laps, tranced by my exhales. I memorized the cracks on the bottom of the pool in Lugavatn, Lane two's gentle warp, the faint odor of sulfur bubbling through the town. Okay, storytellers. Um, since we're talking about form, this is a long run on with just ampersands, but I'm gonna have to breathe at some point so I don't pass out, but just pretend I didn't, there's no spaces. Okay, storytellers. The great grandmothers told us our history. They tried, but we distracted by sweet corn and real butter and tiny bowls of rock salt and toothpick cues of government cheese and the sea in our hair and shirtless boys and our tanned and toughened summer feet and beer stowed and black garbage bags in the canal and swimming in the bay past dark and older cousins out on dates and ashamed of the raised vowels and you are not my mother and still no indoor plumbing and you can't give me a curfew and breaking into a boat in dry dock and our missing parents and gashes stitched by scorched needles and sewing thread and will you just leave me alone and something something your people and something something Canada and something lost their land and now gone long they can't hand us our pests discarded on that sweaty August porch, hus strings at our feet, but lazily. Okay. Chroma. Others report their luscious dreams, elaborate and sexy, scandalous and psychotropic. I am jealous even of their terror. They describe in smug detail their trips to outer space, strange and wondrous liaison, talking fish and spring-jawed beasts. My art school friends kept raggedy archives of their dark time travels, evidence of their busy Freudian minds, offered without an ask. Here, my dream journal, Bigfoot's body with the stepfather's head, the pillowed embrace of a massive squid, something severed and oozing. What if my brain too deeply rests I awake with nothing but the not knowing, whether I don't dream or I'd suffered a scrubbing. All that sticks are the colors, an aspect not found in the night world, or so we're told. When I say I can't recall, they heard my dreams were too fabulous to speak of. In truth, they're almost not there. Saturation slid, they creep green, not like grass, but close, like astroturf but reflective, full with dimension and shine, or the blue-green of oxidized brass, evidence of salt's labor on a dock cleat, or a door knocker shaped like a whale. Two thrifted chairs, acid chartreuse in my row home in Philly, an algae bloom fading towards yellow, an old Jeep, key-scratched olive, bile tossed up after a wild night, talk about not remembering, or the Kelly Green shock of my college roommate's fair isle sweater, or my own hazel eyes turn to emerald when the light falls slant. Okay, reclamation. This is Sausalito specific, but hopefully, or Marin water specific, but hopefully it makes sense. Reclamation. A whale appears in the bay ahead of schedule and far from the Pacific. Because we ache for wonder these days, we think this is a good sign, an omen of a new beginning or some such nonsense, despite her showing ribs. 
We love seeing animals in the wrong places, which is to say near us. Bears in swimming pools, an otter in someone's house eating carrots in the bathtub. When I lived in the high desert, a bighorn sheep stood at the end of the road, still as a mountain. A family of rabbits moved into my truck, cozying the engine block and nibbling the wires, while chipmunks raced nightly through the soffit as if patiently or not so patiently waiting for me to move on. All right, you do need to know something about this one. So um, some of you know, I back in the day, I went to school for metalsmithing and I have way too much metalsmithing art history in my head. So here is um, a poem. <laughs> I can't believe I'm gonna say this, so boring. Um, regarding 16th century Italian metalsmithing. So it's a persona poem, um, Goldsmith's Apprentice. Feel the Arno running damp beneath this stone floor. Some say it's possible to pocket arm splinters under fingernails hidden among charcoal filth. But then I recall his light, that divine beacon rendered in tool work, gem and shine. This summons to sweet penance, a life of worn leathers, four years with bellows till I was seen fit to carry the crucible the precious turnt liquid, a bead held hot and spinning. I'm back bent at 20, my eyesight already gauzed, my fingerprints singed slick. I melt the pitch, its putrid black snugs the gold piece, rolled thin as a long shot, tap, tap, tapped into contours. I chase out delicate angels with wings wide like redemption. I guess that also had to do with Catholicism, but <laughs> now that I think about it. Um, all right, on a lighter note, this is for my Talsenios, a ghost poem. Uh, the first line is the title. So the title is My Ghost Wants to Make Good. Um, think of my ghost as a collective. Take that as you will. My ghost wants to make good use of their time, no matter it is endless and without reckon. My ghost wants to watch 80s movies because they love, love, love the soundtracks, wants to hop around with huge hair, a ripped t-shirt and a hot pink attitude. My ghost wants a big sloppy bowl of migas full of rice and beans with the fresh guac because we're real, but also a little skin. My ghost wants the hatch green chilies in a rumpled paper bag bought from the side of the road, then roasted in the backyard in an old tin drum. My ghost will drink a margarita a little too fast because it's that hot out and they have some forgetting to do. My ghost wants a room full of friends hugging and laughing and toasting each other instead of just the photo. My ghost pinches my earlobe whenever some know-it-all tourist mispronounces our hometown. My ghost does not like being privy to secret information about my neighbor's boyfriend. My ghost seems to have sent some emails in the small hours, angry and drunk, to a man who made assumptions. My ghost wants to be read to aloud, the reader shifting the timber of their voice for different speakers and will start a fight if you say it's overkill. My ghost holds the word grief up over the page stares so long that it starts to levitate. And now we're back to the Bay Area. Um, Cause if I'm not scattered, then you know, it's not me. Perhaps it was just the endorphins. And yet there was that flush of ecstasy running across the Golden Gate Bridge in the early morning fog, all sinew and sweat as I bent dizzy to lace my shoe I hand placed gentle and swift on the salted curve of my back. My idiot heart, so sure this moment was about the sideways glint of the sun kissing the teal ripples of the bay and not the sharks that swim beneath. Curve to curve, angle to sharp angle, agita and sadness, a Loctite fit. When the fog's rolling like that, so thick and pillowy, 
you can't tell whether water meets the sky. I'm gonna do a little time check. Oh, holy moly. Um, okay. Um, since we're on shark talk, worry about everything that isn't the shark. The ear ringing has been nightly for about a year. Famously, infamously tone deaf, I white noise, headphones, smother, sound loop. Ceiling fan, caught rush of an Icelandic waterfall, ferry boat motor, the train to 30th Street Station, air compressor power washer, muffled techno dance pop, traffic in a north midwest town where in winter the lake freezes and is used as a parking lot. And I consider a run above the Arctic Circle on a glacier and whether to wear crampons and what the sound will be like on the uptake, feet pingingly ripped from the ice and oh, what I do for a recording of that. Underwater, the ringing dissipates. And I think about sonar and drawings of sonar, those perfect circles and beginning uninterrupted and wonder what happens when they're crossed, when that ping, hear it in your head now, intersects a submarine or a huge toothed beast of the deep or my body or yours. Ah, we're running out of time, let's see. Um, all right, I'm gonna lay an experiment on you guys and it has a screen share. Sean, I'm so sorry. Um, no worries, I will make you a host. And I have my COVID isolated tech team with me to help. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Yeah. You have it there, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Want the video? Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm not very good at this either. I can't remember where screen share is. Is it on the bottom? Yeah. Okay. okay. What? what? All right. Uh, something weird's happening. You know what? Never mind. I'll just tell you what it is. Okay. It's fine. Sorry. It's fine. The tech failed. Um, there's an installation up at the MoMA, and it might not even be up anymore. And it was made after a poem by Octavio Paz. So this is a poem after an installation after a poem. Um, it has an epigraph. A poem begun on the occasion. Oh, and it's 11 pages long, but I'm just going to read one and a half. Phew, I wouldn't do that to you guys. So it's the beginning, and then it kind of jumps to the middle, jumps to the end. And there's a lot of repetition. Use that time to just focus on the images during that repetition. Um, this is 100% an experiment. Let me apologize in advance if it doesn't work. Anyhow, the epigraph, a poem begun on the occasion of that time, I nearly passed out from the beauty of an art installation by Raphael Cosana Hammer, which was itself made after Octavio Paz. The poem's called A Cloud Becomes. A poem becomes a cloud, becomes a poem. A poem becomes the fog, becomes a poem. A poem becomes a waking dream, becomes a poem. A poem becomes black sparkly stilettos left on the free shelf, becomes a poem. A poem becomes a clump of runaway cells, becomes a poem. A poem becomes a drawer of chargers that fit nothing, becomes a poem. A poem becomes what courses through the veins, becomes a poem. A poem becomes enough potable water for three people for three weeks, becomes a poem. A poem becomes an atmospheric river, becomes a poem. A poem becomes not being able to recall if you took the antihistamines or if you only thought about the taking of the antihistamines, becomes a poem. A poem becomes a night terror, becomes a poem. A poem becomes a days of your gentleman's coat placed over a puddle, becomes a poem. A poem becomes a lost friend, becomes a poem. A poem becomes a man who accidentally brings his guitar to a dinner party and will now play a Dylan song or two while everyone digests, becomes a poem. 
A poem becomes a reality show where everyone is suspect and someone might get engaged becomes a poem. A poem becomes a single yellow sock weathering on the sidewalk becomes a poem. A poem becomes the blackberry sparkling water no one wants becomes a poem. A poem becomes a lurking shark becomes a poem. A poem becomes a phone call, an insistent demand dressed as an offer to update the warranty on a long gone truck becomes a poem. A poem becomes geographic amnesia becomes a poem. A poem becomes that part in the birds where Tippi Hedren with her furs and elaborate hairdo just hops in a tiny boat to cross the lagoon instead of simply driving around it becomes a poem. A poem becomes the way we imagined adulthood becomes a poem. A poem becomes a hostile witness, becomes a poem. A poem becomes snow hunger, becomes a poem. A poem becomes the shrug of, well, nothing lasts forever, becomes a poem. A poem becomes the day we finally meet, becomes a poem. Oh, I'm over, I apologize. Um, I realized that last number was highly indulgent on me. Feel free to send me your feedback or curses or whatever. Um, thanks again, Sean. Thanks to you all. I am weeping seeing the faces of some people I haven't seen in real life in a real long time. So this has been amazing. And thanks to the other readers. Thank you, Linda. Thanks, Claire and Barbara. This has been so great. I have to say, as a poet myself, one of the greatest pleasures of hosting these readings is that I come away with so many ideas for my own work. You know, listening listening to great poets like the three of you, just it's so rewarding and enriching and there's so much play happening. So thank you, I really appreciate it. Um, and so I believe, let's see, what else have we got? Um, well, the next um, SSPS reading will be again on the second Sunday of the month for February, which um, this time it's gonna be the day before Valentine's Day, three o'clock Pacific as usual. This particular reading is gonna be um, a tribute to Susan Benetti who passed away late last year. Um, the readers will be Ken Haas, her partner, Barb Reynolds, Amanda Moore, Janet Jennings, and myself. We're members of Ken's poetry writing group, and we wanted to offer a tribute to her. So um, keep coming back. Uh, it's wonderful to see everybody. If anybody here in the audience is also a poet, um, please do email and let me know if you'd like to be a reader. Um, I think that is all. Please come back. Please keep reading. Please keep writing. Poetry is not just a way of life, but a way to make life better. And uh, thank you all so much. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>